All right, as promised, we got him here in the cantina once again on Rebel Force Radio, Mr. Gary Witta. Gary, so nice to see you again. It's been a long time. It has. We were just talking before the show about when I was last on. It's been a while. It was the, um, as you reminded me, uh, when uh, I had uh, written a story for the very first um, Star Wars A Certain Point of View book, which would have been, let me think, that would have been 2017, because that was the 40th anniversary of the uh, of the first movie. So it has been a while. It has, and yeah. we haven't had a chance to talk to you since you uh, penned the second story yep. uh, from the uh, sequel book, the From a Certain for Point Empire. of View for yep. Empire Rogue Two. I'm I'm going to assume right. that's about our uh, our buddy Zev Seneska. That's right. People people don't always make jokes about. Oh, when are we going to see Rogue Two? Rogue Two. It's like, okay. Well, I'll give you Rogue Two, just not the <laughs> just not the Rogue Two um, that you might expect. So the the nice thing about it was I actually was able to tie into um the movie rogue one in what i thought was kind of a cute way uh if you're not familiar with a certain point of view books are actually really really cool and you should check them out what they did was in 2017 for the 40th anniversary of uh the original star wars they did a they did a book called star wars from a certain point of view it was 40 stories for 40 years um and each one was from the point of view of um a kind of a background character in the star wars movies they're kind of digging deeper into their into their backstory and their perspective. So like a, like a great example would be like the, like the can, the, like, like the, the barkeep, the bartender in the Moss Eisley cantina. I think there was even one from the point of view of the, the, the trash compactor monster that pulls Luke under, <laughs> under. So there was some really, <laughs> some really fun perspectives. And when they Becoming came back to Dianoga. me, like right, that. right. The Dianoga. And when they came back to me to do empire, um, I just remember like, Oh, rogue too. Yeah. Cause that's the, of course the call sign of the pilot. Zev Seneska, who finds Luke and Han out, you know, in Hoth after they they get lost, and I thought well, it would be kind of cool to do a point, a story from from his point of view. And obviously, Rogue Two, you know, ended up being kind of a a, a joke. Uh, but the nice thing about it was, as they were kind of like retcon it in what I thought was kind of a cool way. The idea that the whole idea of there being a Rogue Two and there being a Rogue Squadron was that um, that squadron was was named in honor of Jyn Erso and the whole Rogue One team. You know, because they obviously had all sacrificed their lives to, you know, uh, capture the plans, and without them, there's no rebellion. Uh, and so that was, um, I guess, their way of kind of it's kind of like retiring the jersey. You know, they put it up in the rafters, and um, that whole squadron is 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 kind of retroactively canonized as as having been named in honor of uh, of of Jin and Cassian and that whole team. You know, it's funny you bring up Rogue One. Because I just saw Rogue One in the theater this past weekend in IMAX. How it's cool back. is it that it, it's back and it made a million bucks? Uh, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of that gets funneled to the, the Witta estate. Uh, no? Hello? You'd be surprised. No? <laughs> um, oh, wow. it's, oh, nice. It's, it's funny. So somebody, somebody sent me a story on Twitter this morning saying, hey, look at this. Isn't this cool? Rogue One breaks IMAX uh, premiere box office records. Biggest IMAX uh premiere in in history and uh, i said that's great it'd be even nicer if i saw any money from that but uh, i don't know how much you know about how um how hollywood uh, financials work but writers uh screenwriters typically don't see any money from mm. theatrical box office at all i we see a little bit of what they call ancillary so like you know dvd blu-ray streaming uh if you rent the movie on itunes if you see it on you know tnt um if you uh if you rent it you know rent it if you watch it on disney plus we get a teeny tiny little piece of that but when it's originally in its theatrical run and if it, if it comes back as it just did and it is currently back in theaters on imax um yeah that's that's not something that writers participate in uh financially did you think about hitting the theaters this weekend or uh i would i would like to have gone i just, i'm so desperately busy with work right now i barely have time to like run to the store and get mm -hmm. groceries i did speak to gareth uh just yesterday he was a, he actually took his whole family to go um Good and i think him. it was a treat for him and the whole family to go back and and see it again i i said i actually i wish i could have gone because as, as as much of a thrill as it is to see your name up in the blue letters right you know the iconic blue letters at the end of the movie that to me is like the biggest that's my favorite scene in the movie is when my name comes up. um <laughs> nice. uh it would have been even nicer to see it on an imax screen you know even bigger than than ever but i just i it's and i my understanding is it's still in theaters for a few more days and if i had the time to go i would love to i, I just don't well you're super prolific right now i mean you have so much going on um of course, uh, the, the top of your list would have to be 
this really cool uh, thing you're doing on your Twitch channel. You, you do so many cool things on your Twitch channel all the time. You have something cool and uh, and uh, different and fresh. And, and this time around, it's Gun Dog. Gun Dog, which is uh, tell everybody about Gun Dog and um, and and how you're rolling it out because I don't think. I've ever heard of an author rolling out his novel the way you're rolling this one out in such a cool multimedia fashion. Yeah, I appreciate having the opportunity to talk about it, actually, because unlike Rogue One or any other of the Star Wars projects that, I, that I've done, I don't have like the, a, a big kind of Disney multi-million dollar marketing machine um, to help promote it. It's really just me because it's my own uh, little project. But the short version is um, I'm also a novelist. I, I wrote a, a, a fantasy uh, novel back in uh, 2015 called Abomination, which I really enjoyed writing, and I wanted to try and write something um, in that in that medium again. I really enjoyed writing my first novel, so the, for the second thing, I wrote this this science fiction story called uh, Gun Dog, which is kind of like an it's kind of a mashup of like it's alien invasion, it's post apocalyptic, it's got big, it's got a big giant mech, like a big kind of 60 foot kind of war machine uh, thing. It's really really cool. It's like a lot of my favorite sci fi influences all kind of mashed up into one original story. And uh, I wrote it as a novel, but because I, I finished it uh, kind of at the height of the pandemic and I was thinking about like how to get it published. Maybe I'll self-publish it. Maybe I'll just try and do this on my own just to see what happens. Um, but I also thought, well, if I'm self-publishing the book, why not also try to self-produce the audio book? I don't know if you're familiar with, with, with this, but like audio is like a huge part of how people read books now. It's like practically a third of the market is people who, you know, have books read to them, essentially, you know, via Audible and books on tape have been around forever. But, you know, audio books now, you know, people listen to them on their on their uh, iPod or whatever. And it's 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 a huge deal. So I thought, would, would it be interesting uh, to try and produce the audiobook version myself as well. So I would own and control all of it. I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, anyone taking it away from me. How uh, George Lucas thought, of you. I tried to I tried to Lucas it a little bit. That's right. And <laughs> yeah. I thought, well, it's audio. How hard can it be? Well, it turns out it's actually really quite hard to make decent audio. Um, uh, but I had a good crack at it. I'm fortunate enough because I work in Hollywood. I know actors. I know composers and things like that. So I called up a good friend of mine, uh, Shannon Woodward, who was on HBO's Westworld. And she's in The Last of Us and very well-known um actor very talented and she agreed to go basically perform and narrate the whole thing nine hours of audio um we also got troy baker from the last of us and you know bioshock and uncharted very well known video game uh an animation voice actor uh is in it as well and my friend austin wintry wrote a whole uh orchestral soundtrack for it so we really went above and beyond and produced this very kind of high-end piece of audio we did it all with shoestring and duct tape during the pandemic spent very little money did it all at home on our laptops and our home you know recording equipment but it ended up sounding great. And when it was all done, I thought, well, what's an interesting way, you know, to kind of put this out? I could do a podcast. And in fact, there is a podcast, which I'll tell you about. But I thought it would be interesting because I have a, an audience on Twitch, uh, you know, the, the game streaming platform where now, you know, there's musicians on there, you know, there's people doing you know, cooking shows, you know, Twitch is a kind of a, um, you know, it's all, all kinds of stuff, interesting stuff on Twitch. And I thought, well, would it be interesting to try and debut this as an audio um uh projects i basically tell us tell a story like old-fashioned radio and do it live on twitch almost like a listening party for each episode so i chopped up the audio book into these nine hour long episodes and we brought and we started a, a few weeks ago with episode one and the idea is i each episode i appear live on camera much as i'm here with you now introduce the episode kind of masterpiece theater style to notes episode and i'll kind of talk about it a little bit and then we play the audio and the and the and the aud and the audience in the live chat kind of gets to kind of react and experience it all together, kind of this communal listening experience. And at the end of each episode, I come back as the author and uh, you know answer questions and kind of do like book club discussion, whatever you want to call it. And it's been really really fun. Like people have responded to the story; the response has been tremendous. But people are also responding to the idea of doing it in a different way. Like people all kind of listening to to it together, almost like kind of old fashioned radio. People all kind of listening together and reacting in real time. It's really really cool. Um, I also put the episodes up on my YouTube channel, and then the main part of it, I think, ultimately will be the podcast edition. Uh, which you can subscribe to right now. You can type Gun Dog into any podcast you know provider you might have, um, and it you know you'll, you'll it'll show up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever you know uh, podcast provider you might use. Uh, there should be some episodes there by now. I parked it a little bit because what happened was after I announced it, I got approached by one of these big kind of podcast networks and said, "Hey, why are you doing this on your own when when you know we can distribute it for you and put you in front of a much larger audience and promote it with our other shows and like make a big deal out of it." Um, so we're working on that right now, and that's so that's led to a little bit of a delay 
um, of the podcast version as we, you know, kind of work on it behind the scenes. But I think probably within the next uh, week or two, that'll all be done and episodes will start dropping into the podcast feed. But like I said, if you want to get in on it now, you can subscribe to the podcast. Again, it's G-U-N-D-O-G in any podcast engine you might have. You'll find it there. There's a seven minute prologue that you can listen to right now. And then when episode one drops, it'll it'll come directly into your feed. So I, that's how I think. The Twitch version is very cool, but you have to be there live to... It's funny, we're kind of asking people to do what no one does anymore, which is like show up to <laughs> listen, right. listen to like at, you know, like who watches like, you know, 7 p.m. Wednesday, you got to be there. Like I re- I'm old enough to remember like racing home in my car to like catch the West Wing before it started. Before sure. Evo or DVR. And of course, no one does that now. Now you just watch shows on your own schedule. You binge them. You watch them when you feel like it. So the Twitch version has been cool as like a point as, as appointment viewing, I guess, like people yeah. kind of listen to it together. But the the, the lion's share audience, uh, audience for it will be the you know on the podcast, the way that people in your car or while you're doing the laundry or whatever, like people right listen on. to podcasts that way. And so I'm really excited for the podcast launch. I think that's going to be really, really cool. I'm excited for people to, to hear the story. I'm very proud of it. Well, congrats, man. That, that sounds great. And so, uh, it's gun dog. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you can catch it in, in so many different ways. I, I like your, your live Twitch on Wednesday night though, because that's an event, right? It, right. it is on Wednesdays, right? Every Wednesday. That's what, yeah. We literally call it a live serialized uh, sci-fi audio event. And that's, kind of, again, almost getting back to the idea. Of, the funny thing is in the internet age, everything is everything that's old is new again, right? It's like uh, when you know, narrative narrative podcasts have become a big deal recently, right? That's a very yeah. big emerging space and like big Hollywood stars are getting in on it. It's like, oh, what a concept, you know, like it's, it's fiction, <laughs> but it's audio and you listen to it. And it's like, yeah, we had that in the 1930s. It was called radio. Um, <laughs> but then, but now, but now you, but now you listen to it on your on your phone instead of a, a instead of a radio. But that is that that is kind of the old fashioned concept that uh, the live version was meant to kind of get back to. It's almost again like long before we were born. But the idea of like everyone kind of would huddle around the radio, you know, to listen sure. to the shadow or you know gun smoke oh, yeah. or whatever. And and it's also almost like the cinema. The cinema experience, right? We talked about Rogue One being back in theaters. Part of watching a movie together is like everyone gasps or cheers at the same moment. You feel like you're experiencing something together. And Gundog in, in the live iteration is a little bit like that in the sense that when, you know, the live chat is always happening off to the side. So when I kill off a character or whatever, a big plot twist happened, everyone goes, oh, my God, they all, they, they all kind of get to react together and have that sense of kind of experiencing something together. So, yeah, that's been – and for me as a writer, you know, who lives on feedback – it's it's really fun to see that happening. Like I've reduced the feedback window to zero because I'm seeing it happen in real time as the story is being narrated by Shannon. So that's been, as I, I'm sitting there kind of listening to everyone else and watching the chat, that's been really a, a fun experience for me as a writer to see how people are experiencing it in real time. Let me throw yeah. a pitch at you. Not many, not many uh, storytellers have that opportunity as you say to narrow that and, but that but that's the time. beauty of the internet age and these streaming platforms where you can present something to an audience in real time and so i'm surprised more people like i'm surprised that this is the first time that it's been done like it is kind of a cool idea i guess i'll give myself credit for that it's the first time that you know a an, an original literary work from a somewhat well-known you know writer has been essentially published in this way on a on a social media platform on a, on a streaming platform like twitch and again i've also put it on my youtube channel you can you can you can listen to the episodes there and of course as a um as a podcast and then when the whole thing is done the book the actual book that you can read um uh, you know once the audio version is done i'll, I'll publish the actual book because like i i like to read but I, funny thing is i did an audio book but i personally don't like to listen to audio books i would much rather sit and read and so for people who uh, might be thinking, hey, this story sounds pretty cool. I'm just not really into audio books. Well, the actual book will be will will come out um, at the conclusion of the audio series. So, this, hopefully, whichever way you want to consume it, there's there's some way for you to truly get it. multimedia. You know, which is again very Star Warsy. Actually, when you right when you think right? about it, are all the like the, the the serialized version? Does that contain the exact same content as the novel, or are there any differences between the two? It, it, that, that was actually a really interesting kind of thing to discover is that when I first wrote the book, I wasn't thinking about audio. I just right. wrote it to be to be read off the page. And then when Shannon started recording it, what I realized was not not that often, but every now and again, there was a sentence that sounded better in your head when you were reading it than when it's read aloud. And mm-hmm. so every now and again, when I would get Shannon's audio back, it's like, you know what, that sentence, as it turns out, is a bit of a, like, for example, like some sentences that 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 read fine on the page because you get to read at your own pace 
Mm-hmm. Or it's a bit of a tongue twister for Shannon to actually deliver the line. And so every now and again, I would go back and just retool a line. So if you were to take the audio script and the manuscript of the book and compare them, I would say they're like 99.5% the same. But every now and again, there's a line that was retooled just to kind of make it better suited to be read aloud for audio. Yeah, I, that makes me think about uh, uh, behind the scenes shooting the original Star Wars. Harrison Ford would occasionally run into some clunky George Lucas dialogue on the page, and he'd say, "George, you can read this shit, but you can't say it." It's and I true. Just always, it's very oh, true. true. <laughs> Stuff often sounds better on the page than it does read aloud. That's why when I'm writing a script, I often, you know, I try to imagine the writers saying it. That was actually one of the most sobering moments I had as a writer. Very early in my career, I wrote a script, the first script that I ever sold. Um, At one point, Kurt Russell was attached to play the lead. And I actually got to go to Kurt Russell's house and sit with him and talk about the script. And it was a really cool experience. Goldie Hawn brought us cookies. It was it was (laughs) mad. (laughs) <laughs> it was so it was so because i didn't even put it for some reason I, I mean i knew they were married right but i didn't put it together i'm sitting in kurt russell's living room mm. and this very nice lady comes in and says oh would you boys like some cookies and i look up and it's goldie horn i'm like what is my career like this is insane <laughs> so that was very cool but the sobering part of it was kurt was like i really like the script but like there's some dialogue that we're going to need to change i was like, okay well let's get into it and kurt oh, kurt's you know he was an act he was a child star right he's been in hollywood all his life like, he's been a, a, a you know reading dialogue off the page for 50 years and trying to make it work and i remember he said he said i'll give you one example here's like a passage of dialogue that you've that you've written i am going to read this now i'm not going to try and phone it in or mess it up for the sake of like make it i'm going to read this as best i'm going to like use all of my acting skills to make this line deliver this line as best i can and he did it and it did not sound good i'm like oh wow now i get it Okay, so we're going to have to redo that line and so that's been a similar experience is when you're writing a novel like that once it's written that is then conveyed directly to the the reader it goes right into their brain right as they're reading it uh but when you're writing dialogue for you know whether it be an audio podcast or, or a star wars movie or whatever it might be that has to go through the conduit of an actor who has to deliver it and sell it and you're right i mean i i've heard those stories where you want to you know faster more intense like we've all heard the the star wars stories that some of that dialogue is kind of clunky and that is one of the gifts of a great actor is they can they can actually sell really clunky dialogue you know what would be a lot of fun is to take somehow if we could every iteration of the rogue one script from when you started working on it all the way through to the final edit that we see on screen. And somehow we can mash it up and make an audio drama of the entire story with everything that ended up on the cutting room floor, somehow rethink it to make all the scenes fit together and have the ultimate Rogue One story being told. Because we know so much of Rogue One changed after the story left your hands. So, okay, so there's a couple of points about that. that you raise a really interesting point for a couple of reasons. First of all, what's interesting about that is, of course, that idea is not unprecedented in Star Wars, right? They went all the way back to the adventures of Luke Starkiller and turned that into a big comic book, right? They, they, they took the, uh, George's original draft, which, again, right. was vastly different from the film that he ended up making. That also yeah. went, like, this, again, it's steeped in Star Wars tradition for scripts to go through, like, major, major changes and major evolution of story from the very first iteration to the version you see. I've got a copy of it here. The Lucasfilm gave me a copy when I started it. It was, like, The Adventures of Luke Starkiller. And it's mm-hmm. vastly different to the movie that was made. Um, in the, t- in, in terms of Rogue One though, I mean, you're right. Also again, lots of iterations, lots of writers came and went, you know, the scripts evolved in many ways. Um, but I would argue that the ultimate version of Rogue One is pretty much what you, you saw. I think that all the development was for the best. There was a lot of stuff in, in my scripts that I'm glad, you know, we, we, we moved past because it wasn't the best version of the movie. There's a couple of little things left over from my version of the script where I'm like, eh, I kind of wish they'd have kept that. I feel like that was, you know, I would have done that slightly. There's a couple of moments in the final film where I'm like, eh, I would have done that slightly differently, but they're few and far between. For the most part, I'm like, yeah, like you can see, like d- people always think that like development, reshoots things like that are the signs of a troubled production and i remember all the headlines at the time but i'll give you one example what's let me ask you this question what is what do you think is most people's what would you say is most people's favorite scene from rogue one the vader in the hallway yeah yeah that was that was a reshoot done at the last minute Mm -hmm. 
And so yeah. it goes to show that sometimes, whether it's reshooting, whether it's rewriting, whether it's, you know, in the edit room, again, we've all heard this, story. we all know the stories of, you know, how much, you know, Marsha Lucas played the influence that she played in editing the original movie and kind of, you know, making stuff that wasn't working, taking stuff that wasn't working and making it work. That process never, you know, from the very first kind of story meeting all the way up to locking the final cut, you're always asking the question, can we make this better? Can we make this better? Until, until the very last minute. And Rogue One's a perfect example. They were, you know, I, I, said, Gar I, mean, I remember Gareth telling me the story. He was sitting in the edit bay reviewing footage. Like the film was shot. Um, and he was sitting in the edit bay with Jabs, one of the editors. And Jabs said to him, I feel like we need something here. I feel like there's an extra thing that we could add. And that's where Vader in the hall. And they went back and sh they built that set. And they went back and shot it. And it's, it, like I said, many people's favorite scene. <laughs> Gary, did you know when you were working on Rogue One that a character like Darth Vader was yours to utilize? Like, what was what was off limits at the time that you were uh, involved in the film? They didn't have any hard and fast rules. They just gave us a. There was a general sentiment of of encourage us, encouraging us to expand the universe and not just you know kind of fall into the trap of fan service and let's see this character and let's see that character um in, in lucasfilm i've heard it called the small universe problem where this it's the same eight characters that keep bumping into each other right because there's this tremendous uh desire to like oh i want to see boba fett i want to <laughs> see obi-wan kenobi i want to see han solo but you know what there's more than three people in this galaxy there's lots and lots and lots of people and i feel like you know now that they're telling so many stories in television the opportunities are presenting themselves to like to broaden the net and it doesn't always have to be the same few characters um and so the general again it was just a guideline there was never any hard and fast rules but it was like let's see new characters this doesn't have to be like the saga films and of course from a story point of view it can't be the same characters right they have their own part in the story it's not like uh, we're going to see Luke Skywalker and Han Solo stealing the, the Death Star plans. We know that they don't come into the story until afterwards. And so we did have to come up with a whole new crew of, of characters that could populate this movie. But I do remember Gareth and I saying, like, that's great. And we want to do um, original characters and we want to grow the universe. Uh, and it's cool to create new Star Wars characters rather than just write ones that already exist. Um, but there was also a sense like there's got to be something like this. There's got to be something iconic that people can like, given that this is all totally new. And at the time, we didn't know if the idea of a standalone movie would work. It's something different from the saga films like that has something that has to be communicated to the audience. This is not Luke Skywalker. It's something else. Uh, it was like, what, what is the connective tissue that we can have that feel like, like some familiar elements that will make people understand right away? Oh, this is Star Wars, even though I don't recognize most of these characters. And that's where the idea of so Vader and Tarkin were the two that made the most sense to us because look it's the death star right and this movie takes place literally like the day before a new hope sure. and so and we know and we know that tarkin and vader are on the death star we know that you know tarkin is you know played a big part in you know in constructing it and uh it's newly built and so it would almost seem weird to not have them there so why are they suddenly showing up now like it made sense for them to be in the continuity um and so vader you know we always knew we wanted to have him and but not again don't overuse it which is why he's only in right. a couple of scenes um you know he's so iconic you don't want to overdo it i feel like less is more with a character like vader and then again with tarkin it was you know again like he's so clearly like he, he didn't just show up yesterday like he's been there a while on the death star mm -hmm. so let's make sure that he's there as well then of course there was the whole question well how are we going to do that you know peter well, that's why I, I wanted to ask you that as well, because as you were writing, um, did you have to concern yourself with the possibilities and, you know, as far as what what it might take to, uh, you know, bring a character like Tarkin back to life? Or were you just sort of, you know, unchained from all of those constraints and parameters and you're just like dreaming big and this is what I would like to see in the, in an ultimate story before A New Hope? So it was. It, re it really was an evolution from 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 one to the other for me, and it happened very quickly. And one of the luxuries of working on a movie that you know is going into production, like I was, I wrote the movie at the Lucasfilm offices in an office. In Gareth was next door to me, and right across the hall from me is the ILM art department. And that was the amazing thing about making the movie is I would write a scene and we would go across the hallway the next day and it's like all beautifully painted. Oh my God. Oh, that's what Vader's castle looks like. I just wrote that wow. yesterday. That's amazing. <laughs> and so it's amazing. this incredible kind of creative feedback loop that you get into is they're bringing their ideas to you, bringing, bringing them to life in real time. With Tarkin, I was nervous because like, well, how can you do this? Like Peter Cushing is, is, is gone. Uh, and, you know, and so what, what are we going to do? Like, do you find an actor that looks like him? Uh, our audience is going to accept that. I don't know. I just knew from a storytelling 
perspective, he needed to be in the movie. It would seem like he's missing without it. And, uh, and of course, my co-writer of the story is John Knoll, who is also, you know, one of the leading lights at ILM. And so we got to have these these conversations that talked about both. Like, this, these are the needs of the story. Um, and this is what, so this is, and this is how we would realize it through the magic of ILM. And of course, John has got one foot in both worlds. So it was really easy right. to have that conversation with him. And again, I didn't give ILM enough credit because I, I, I would say, I feel like talking, we should put him in the movie, but like, how do we do that? And I remember John saying, don't worry about that. <laughs> Write him into the movie the way you think he should be. And we will solve that problem. That's what right. we do here at ILM. I was like, this has never been done before. And he's like, that's what we do here at ILM. And so I wrote, I still didn't hundred percent buy into it. Cause when I first wrote him in the movie, I wrote, he was, he's, he's in my version of the movie, but like in fewer scenes and it was always, and it was like, they were short scenes and I would always write, he's like kind of like in shadow. It's like, I'm trying to give ILM like a lot of margin for error here. And they were, and, and then of course, when I saw, when I was on set and I saw some of the dailies and they've got the actor who plays uh talk and I can't mean guy, something a tremendous actor. Guy Henry, um, yeah. Guy Henry and he played him as a step full like full lights motion capture rig like like he's the main only character on the scene I was like oh you guys are going for it and this incredible performance capture and Guy Henry was able to just that voice I mean he sounds just like him um and then of course they digitally you know recreated Peter Cushing over Guy's performance and that's how they created him and I, I still remember to like watching the movie with an audience for the first time they they almost they almost dare you to believe they haven't done it like when you first see target it's from behind and he's like start peering out and looking at the death star from the star destroyer bridge and you just see the back of his head and i feel like the movie's making making you think yeah i get that's Tarkin, but you're only going to see the back of his head because how are they going to do it but then he turns around and i heard everyone in the audience go <gasps> it's like they right. actually did it and so that i thought was really cool they did it and oh, they my keep coming back and doing it over and over and all of a sudden you realize oh my god i'm watching peter cushing's latest movie right right and then they and yeah. of course then they did it again with Leia at the end yeah right yeah. so my my understanding no. of that from um was that they showed that to carrie and she didn't believe it uh, the, 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 her reaction again i wasn't in the room but i was told this second hand but it was like carrie said where did you find that footage of me and they were like no that's digital and she was like oh my god like she almost couldn't believe what they had done wow yeah my, my wife elbowed me when uh tarkin showed up on screen and said oh they brought him back for this <laughs> i'm like yeah <laughs> right you don't know the lengths right. they had to go through I to bring him back <laughs> I, I, I saw I saw reviews that thought we used a lookalike. I saw reviews that thought that didn't think the CG looked convincing. I mean, I've I've heard every version. I've saw I've seen people that were convinced that was Peter Cushing, and then again we had pulled footage, you know, unused footage from you know a new home, which we we did do in other places, but we didn't. I don't think believe we used uh, any Peter. Cushing. They had a lot of reference yeah. for Tarkin um, and for Peter and for Peter Cushing's like kind of three D facial map that they had reconstructed. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, every, everyone seemed to think it was done in a different way. Gary, how's it make you feel, you know, now that we're, you know, 10 years into the Lucasfilm Disney, um, era and, and I'm sure you hear this a lot. We hear it a lot here at rebel forest radio that after all this time and all of this great, you know, entertainment that's come out between these two powerhouses that a lot of fans, more than a few continue to say that Rogue One is still the peak of the post uh, George Lucas era of Star Wars. How does that make you feel? So the, the, the first thing I would say in response to that is like, I always temper the degree to which I allow myself to kind of feel flattered or, or proud of that because, you know, I'm fully aware of the fact that I'm just one very small piece of that movie. Uh, and indeed just one small piece of even the writing of that movie you know, there were three other writers on the film there are some, un you know, some, some uncredited writers you know there's a lot of a lot of different people helped tell that story just just the writing of it and so you know i yes i was the so john you know as you know kind of wrote a very rough early version of the story i developed it into a full story and then wrote the first version of the screenplay and then chris Wright, chris, uh, chris whites of course came after me we we ended up becoming good friends it's like it's like a relay race i was using like a relay race like you run you 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 run with the baton until you're exhausted and then you hand it off to someone else and they run the next lap and and eventually you you, you kind of get it done but a big movie like that it's almost unheard of for them to be written by just one person in these days they tend to 
kind of want to you know, bring a lot of riders on to make sure again it's like notice that a good lot as, in the last several not, years yeah not uncommon um and so i you know many people say anytime on twitter people say oh yeah thanks for writing that movie or it's my favorite i'll always say co-wrote you know don't forget and you know, I, 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 there are certain, obviously there are lots of parts of it that I can point to go, yep, that's me. That's me. I came up with that. Oh, I wrote that bit. But there's also lots of other things. Like when someone says, oh, I love Chirrut and Bays, I always say, well, you should thank Chris Weitz because he created those characters. Um, and so, you know, it's all kind of divvied up. Having said that though, having played even a small part in something that, you know, is, is, is now part of it's such a larger whole, like to be a part of the Star Wars canon. To, and to kind of lay a brick in that foundation and see it now reflected in other things like you know you see saw Gerrera show up in video games it's oh the things that we established in that movie now continue to go forward and influence you know the next generation of star wars creators and that's amazing and again i the blue letters thing comes from when we first saw the premiere um when the credits were rolling chris white's nudged me and said we're in the blue letters and i was I just thinking <laughs> like that's the best thing ever like the 10 year old version of me who was like playing with my, you know, kind of Star Wars action figures could never have mm -hmm. imagined that, that that would happen. And so it's, it's been brilliant. And yeah, I, I mean, particularly with Rogue One and this new era of films and uh, every now and again, I don't know how it happens, but every now and again, Rogue One like blows up on Twitter again. It's such, it trends like reliably every like t two or three times a year right now, of course, obviously because it's back in theaters, but sometimes someone just posts a tweet like, Oh, here's a random Rogue One appreciation post or whatever. And it gets retweeted <laughs> and it just organically kind of bubbles up again. And I know that there are, there have been polls, some of the like IGN and there were some other big media outlets have done polls. Like what's your favorite star Wars movie or, or, or more, more strictly, like what's your favorite movie of kind of the new Disney era and of the Disney era. And again, I'm not trying to brag. This is just, a fact rogue one is always number one by like a mile and so uh given that you know the, the disney era movies have been i think most people would say a bit of a mixed bag you know there's there's a little bit of everything in there the fact that we came out on the right side of that equation especially considering how nervous we were going in like right i mean the, the 789 the prequel trilogy obviously had its own um uh set of you know pressures in like you got to continue the story but we were we were writing even though it was a standalone we were writing a story that was like directly adjacent to the original film like the one that started it all and that was really that was really nerve-wracking to me it's like what if it's so bad that it like blights the original film and be like oh, i can't watch Star Wars in what Rogue One ruined it for me that's the nightmare scenario in fact the opposite happened where i i've heard people tell me that this is the best compliment we've ever got on rogue one is that people tell me it think that that now they think it makes the original movie better because you know all the context and you know everything that happened to like get the Death Star plans. It's like, oh my God, all these people died on Scarif and now this stupid kid on a farm's got those plans and doesn't know what to do with them. Like <laughs> it just, you know, and, and I've seen people even have kind of like have um, edited, they've kind of stitched the two movies together. Yes. And kind of created yes. connective tissue in the edit so that like it, you can watch, you can watch the whole contiguous thing. So it's brilliant. Uh, and like I said, I, I was only a very small part of it, but what, but what an amazing thing to be a small part of. And of course, you know, its popularity has been so solid that it's now spawning a spinoff in the Andor series. Uh, what are we looking forward to seeing in that? And were you brought in in any way, shape or form to consult or work on this series? No, I wish I wish I could tell you. I, I heard about it when you did. I'll see it when you did. There are plenty of people out there that are, you know, in the press who have, who have seen it. I, I certainly haven't. I When it arrives on Disney+, Plus, that is when I will have the opportunity uh, to see it. Uh, I, I didn't come back. Gareth didn't come back. Chris Weitz didn't come back. Um, so uh, it is, you know, it's, it's a continuation, obviously, of the Rogue One uh, universe of that little chunk of the timeline. I got to do my own little bit of that because I, after I was done on, Rogue One, as I'm sure you know, I wrote several episodes of Star Wars Rebels, and right. and, and that right. had some Rogue One, you know, Rebels and Andor, as best as I understand it, is like not that far apart in terms of the chronology. Right, it's all like immediately pre Rogue One. Uh, sorry, I, I'm sorry. Uh, well, Rogue One and A New Hope, and so the, I wrote I wrote an episode of um, uh, season four of Rebels where uh, Forrest Whitaker came back as Saw Gerrera, and we and, and we and we got to kind of write that character, knowing how he'd already been established in the movie. And in fact, some of the stuff that I really wanted to put in Rogue One, I ended up finding ways to sneak it into Rebels instead. And we told the story through the animated show um, instead. So I think I think it's great. I have no idea what to expect from that show. Like I said, I'll, I'll see it when you all do. Awesome. As, well, we're looking forward to it, obviously. As someone who, you know, has written a, a, a screenplay for a Star Wars film, uh, what, what would it be, have been like for you, like with the... Uh, uh, when they decided, well, let's take this Kenobi feature 
it's a two hour film and let's make it six hours and make it season one of perhaps a, a multi season. What is that something that uh, you would have enjoyed when you were working on rogue one, if they'd have knocked on your door and said, yeah, you know, this two hour movie, we're going to make it into a TV series. What advantages are there? And then what disadvantages are there as a writer? I don't know. I mean, I think you are, you know, one of the things I often think about when I develop original material these days is like, what is it? Is it a TV or is it a, a movie? Because we've gotten to the point now with the two mediums are kind of in parity, right? Like this, this, we have back in the day, we didn't have such a thing as prestige TV. Now we have it, right? We have like, you know, Game of Thrones or the Mandalorian, all these kind of amazing high end TV shows that have the same production values and are as well written as anything, you know, you would see in movies. Like TV used to kind of feel like cinema's you know, kind of like poorer brother, not anymore, right? Some of the best storytelling is on is on television now. Um, and so it's really a question of like, what's the, like, do I need two hours to tell this story or do I need 10? Like, so like, what's the, it, it, would, would this work better, better episodically or all in one chunk? And every story has its own creative answers to that question. I, I thought Rogue One worked very well as a two hour film. Had I been brought in to write it as, Let's say that Rogue One never existed, but it now came up as an idea as like a Disney Plus TV show. And now you've got to tell the story of the Death Star plans over 10 hours. I'm, I'm sure there would have, I'm sure there would have been a great way to, I have never given it any thought until right now when you asked me the question, I'm sure there's a great way to tell that story as well. But at the time, of course, we were, you know, Lucasfilm was primarily focused on film. Now it's more television, but at the time it was, you know, film, 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 um, you know, and that's to me. The TV stuff is great, but I personally always like for me, Star Wars is cinema, right? Like mm, yeah. Star Wars is is big screen movie making, you know, the, the the fanfare. And I think to some extent, even even with the biggest TV you've got in your house, you can only <laughs> recreate that to some 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 movies, some stories really do demand, you know, a big a big screen and that whole kind of theatrical experience, you know, IMAX, that whole thing, you know, can getting, getting transported yeah. to another world. Um so I, I, th I think it could have worked equally well in either either format. And I think it's really interesting to see, like, back in 2014, when we were work working on Rogue One, the TV landscape, there was no Disney Plus, right? Netflix wasn't what it is today. Um, and so just in the last few years since Rogue One has come out, that, that landscape has shifted massively. Like, so, like, again, if someone had the idea for Rogue One today, it would more likely be developed for television because that, that's just commercially where, the, you know, the market is right now. Most definitely. And remind us of the character of Andor and where he originated. Did he show up in your in your screenplay, that character? That's a combination of me and Chris, but mostly Chris. Um, Jin always had like a like another like a, a like a rebel um not sidekick, but you know, they were partners essentially on mm -hmm. the on the mission. Um and you know, he worked for the worked for the rebellion and was, you know, kind of like a you know, I had like a, he was like a spy intelligence background. So there were some elements of Cassian in the earlier version of the character. But when Chris came on, um, he pushed him much more towards the version of the character that you see in the movie now. And then um, after Chris left and, you know, subsequent writers came on, like he, he, he developed more and more. So I would say it's like probably, I think Cassian is like 80%, you can't really do the math on stuff like this, but like, <laughs> I don't know, 20% me, I would say like 70% Chris and then 30% like whoever else, you know, helped bring it over the, over the finish line. So um, yeah, it, again, and, it, and it's you know, K2SO went through a similar um, evolution and Krennic, like you know, all of these characters, you know, they, the, the, the fundamentals don't change, but the way, you know, the, the expression evolves a lot through, through all the drafts of the script. You know, it's funny. You mentioned how excited people were to see Tarkin in, in Rogue One. Uh, I've seen a lot of chatter online. People are excited that the possibility of seeing Krennic in Andor. So you kind of you know help create your own your own Tarkin or it's well, established. Well, I mean, who knows? The one thing that I've heard, and again, I've not been following it very closely. But the one thing I heard the other day was they said like no fan service. So I think uh -huh. if people are looking for like oh there's Krennic or oh there's Tarkin or oh there's a character I recognize from Star Wars, I, I'm getting the sense that the people making it just aren't interested uh, in mm -hmm. that. So I don't know how like the hardcore fan base are going to feel like that because to me, you know, part of it's not the point of doing it. And I think you do have to like the fan service, you have to kind of make understand that like a little, a little goes a long way. It can't all be about that. Um, but part of the fun of, you know, the Marvel movies and to, to a lesser extent, I think the star Wars movies going, Oh, look, that's that, you know, even he, he, like, oh, I, like rogue one's a great example, a little star Wars Easter eggs. Like it's funny. I'll tell you a story. When we did the premiere, 
they always have like the 501st, the Rebel Legion and Mandalorian Mercs, the real fans, the cosplayers. They they invite a bunch of them to the premiere, you know, so there's great pictures on the red carpet, but they also come in to see the film and they sit way in back. Like the last like five uh, rows in the back are all the cosplayers and all the hardcore fans and all the movie executives and producers, of course, have the best seats in front. Um, and what's funny is, you know, because by this point, you're, you're like, you know, the movie backwards and front. So you're more kind of like listening to the audience react to the movie than you are the movie. Like, you know what the movie is, you just don't know how the audience is going to react. And so you're listening. Um, and anytime there was a really obvious Easter egg, like for example, Vader's the biggest one. As soon as Vader shows up, everyone goes, because <gasps> like, who doesn't know who Darth Vader is, right? And the, but then there's all these different levels because there are different levels of Easter eggs. When, um, uh, I'm going to forget the name of the guy, but you know, the uh, uh, We're Wanted Men, that guy, you know, and War, oh, Warris yeah. guy is his buddy. Dr. Um, Evazan and Dr. Ponda Evazan Baba. Dr. and Ponda yeah. Baba. Um, so he shows up in Rogue One, right? And that's like, that's a deeper cut. Like not everyone recognizes him, but if you've seen Star Wars more than a couple of times, you probably go, oh, that's the guy from the Mos Eisley Cantina. And you hear a little ripple, but less so, because it's not as recognizable as Darth Vader. And then the really, really deep cuts show up. And funnily enough, they're all from Rebels. <laughs> you see the gut when you see the ghost on the landing pad at Yavin, right? When you hear the radio guy say General Sandula reports of blah blah blah, or the, this is the biggest one is when Chopper rolls by. It's a two second shot, like hidden in the back of the scene, but you hear all the guys at the back go woohoo! Like they all recognize every little <laughs> Easter egg, no matter how granular it is. Like Chopper's in that movie for like two seconds, and you it's blinking, you'll miss it, and you really I, I have to point like there he is in the back. You you better believe those Star Wars fans saw him. <laughs> Some we of did. us older fans were yelling and screaming for red leader, gold leader. Oh, yeah. That being uh, that, a, a big let, thrill. Like, <laughs> let me tell you something. My favorite things to write sometimes were the things that didn't even need to be written, but which mm -hmm. have to be part of the movie, right? Because we know there's going to be a big rebel um, uh, X-Wing attack. So I, I, I have such a funny, I have a sense memory of this that is like, I still get a chill thinking about it. Like there's, I didn't come up with anything. There's nothing clever or creative on my part about it. It's just something I got to do. I got to sit and write red leader, red leader standing by, gold leader standing by, lock as in attack position. And it was just like, I just got to write that like <laughs> for a new Star Wars film. Like it was just, that, that was a really giddy thrill. You got to type it out. I got to type it out. Well, you're such an established, you know, your, your fandom has been so established as an original generation Star Wars fan. So yeah. we'd like to wrap up our interview with something we do for our guests. It's okay. a, a questionnaire of, um, of, of Star Wars questions that might appear to be very simple on the surface, but can provide some of the most complex answers. These questions are not like a trivia quiz, is it? Oh, no. No, sir. No, no, okay. no. Okay. This is a young Because I'm not as good as Star Wars trivia as you might anyone think. Anyone can do a trivia quiz. This is, this is for this, real okay. fans. This is, this is more soul searching? Okay. Yes. All right, I'm up Definitely for it. Definitely soul searching here. And uh, okay. th these are uh, questions that were compiled by uh, Yoda during his exile on Dagobah. He had nothing else to okay. do. Okay, all right. But, uh, are you going to read them like Yoda? For a podcast. No, that doesn't happen. Uh, that doesn't happen. We we do have a, an opening intro, though, uh, created by um, lounge lizard Richard Cheese. The Yoda questionnaire. There it is. Wow, is that is that the actual Richard Cheese? You got to do that? It is Richard, yes. It's amazing. <laughs> Very impressed. All right. Gary Witta, keep in mind there are no wrong answers. There are some well, that are more we'll right than others, but there are no wrong answers. So we'll start off with number one. Who or what? Because we want to be inclusive here. Is your favorite Star Wars character? Who or what? What? Admiral Akbar. Mm, I, 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 I don't know why. I just always loved that character. He was originally written into Rogue One and we replaced him. It turned out it was like, oh, oh so uh, we, I remember the day they came in and said, JJ's using him in episode oh, seven. Oh. So let's not go, let's not do Akbar back to back. And so that's our general, Ra uh, sorry, Admiral Radis was created. But that part was originally written for Admiral Akbar. I've just always had a, I've had a, I've always had a soft spot for for Akbar. I love the Mon Calamari. I think they're super cool. Excellent. Really and you I are the very do. first who has ever dropped Admiral mm. Akbar as your there favorite you go. Star Wars character. 
All right, this we're is gonna... the first time I ever heard he was actually considered for Rogue One as well. So yeah, I think I, I may have told that story before. All right, we're going to venture over to the dark side now. Who or what is your least favorite Star Wars character? This is the one that you just every time they come on screen or across the page, just get me out of here. I mean, I, I guess it's a really lazy and obvious thing to say Jar Jar, but I, I mm -hmm. really genuinely don't like that character. And I think there are lots of legitimate reasons why not. I remember one of the things when we were first work, working on Rogue One, John, who had, it's, really is a student of, of Star Wars and the history and the production of it, and um, he had a whole thesis and a presentation of like humor in Star Wars. We all, we all know that humor is really important to the star wars universe right like they're not comedies but without humor they wouldn't be the same films um and some of our favorite moments are humorous moments right look uh, and john had this little presentation of various clips from movies across at the time you know it was all all six films um of where when humor works in star wars and why and when it doesn't work and why and the very simple conclusion that he had was anytime humor comes from character and tells you something about character it's funny and the example he gave is a very subtle example. It's not a big laugh. It's just a cute little character moment is when Han Solo and C-3PO first meet in A New Hope. And he says, hello, sir. And Han Solo just kind of like rolls his eyes. Like, who's this fucking guy? <laughs> like, that's a really that's a really understated moment, but it always gets a laugh because it tells you something. Like, right? And, me, and, and that dynamic that's established in the first two seconds of the meeting is the dynamic that plays out across the whole rest of their relationship. Some right? of the funniest right. moments, I think, in all of Star Wars is the stuff between Han and 3PO and Empire Strikes Back. Because right. It, it is very subtle, and it tells you everything you need to know about those two characters. So exactly, well done. Exa exactly right. And that's why, and again, humor that comes from character. And then John's second part was, here's where humor doesn't work. It's when it comes from slapstick. And he gave some examples. I can't remember, but he gave a couple of examples from the original trilogy where he felt that humor didn't work because it was it was too slapsticky. Um, but the, and then of course, like the classic example from the Phantom Menace is like Jar Jar's kind of slipping around in the in the in the in the shit. Uh, you know, it's and and it, like and taking Pratt falls and stuff. And that's again part of the reason. This, bringing it back around, part of the reason why I don't like Jar Jar is so much of the humor is slapstick humor, and that's just not my. I don't I don't find it very funny. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a little it it's kind of talking down to the audience, I think, a little bit. And even and even as kids, you know, you know, there's ways to be uh humorous with kids without kind of just playing right. the lowest common denominator. Uh he is not an unpopular answer to that question. I will I know, you. I wish I had to come up with something like so. I thought my Akbar, like you said, oh, that was unexpected, but like a Jar Jar's <laughs> the most obvious. I, I'm I'm trying to think of like what would what would a more let me see if I can come up with something by the end if I've got a better answer than Jar Jar. But Jar Jar's my fallback. Uh as a writer, I love asking these questions. Um we skip it sometimes for folks uh who aren't writers, but this is a great opportunity. Uh what is your favorite star wars line there's a lot of classic iconic lines of dialogue but what is your favorite you know what i've got a good one for you because it's not gonna be an obvious one it's a it's a line and a moment it's one of my i personally think that return of the jedi is a very underrated film i know it gets a lot of hate mostly because of the ewoks but i think it's terrific there's so much to like about that film. And so much of the Battle of Scarif at the end of the Rogue One is so heavily influenced by the Battle of Endor. Mm. Then you can kind of mm. see where the obvious parallels are. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's beautifully put together. It's, I think it's such a great culmination of the story. Um, you know, all the loose ends are wrapped up. It's so emotional by the end. I, when I was 11 years, 11 years old, I was crying at the end of Return of the Jedi in the movie theater. And that the best space battle ever put on film, still to this day. I love all the stuff on Tatooine, the sail barge, the rancor, all that stuff is terrific. Um, and it's just the end door, the speeder bike chase is incredible. Like there's so much great stuff in that movie, but because it has the Ewoks, it has this bad reputation. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I agree. There's a you. Line. It's my, it happens to be my favorite of, of all of them. I'm but, glad to, yeah, when people ask me what my favorite movie is, I always say Empire, but like Jedi is right there as well. Yeah, it's just it's just sentimentally. It's like I just there's so much about it. I love um, and there's a line that I it, it, it's not like it's not a clever necessarily a clever line. It's just such a great moment. And it's so brilliantly acted. Uh, the moment of realization is when they when the rebel fleet jumps out of hyperspace and you know, to attack the Death Star. 
and um well we got to get we got to be able to get some kind of reading on that shield up or down and then he says well how can they be jamming us if they don't know if we're coming and it's that moment of, <laughs> of him realizing that it's a setup that yeah. i just my, i got chills when i saw that for the first time i watched that scene a lot and billy d williams delivers that line so brilliantly and it's also just the cleverness of you don't understand what the other what his co-pilot is saying but you yeah. don't need to like you, you're only here to I need to understand one half of the conversation for it to make sense and like i just just a little moment that i that i love in that film wow that's a cool observation i like that a lot too yeah. that is that it's it's all in the delivery, right? With uh, right? with Billy D. Go back and watch it again, and you can see the moment where the light bulb goes off in Lando's <laughs> head. He's like, "Oh yeah. shit! They know we're coming." It's really, really <laughs> yeah. well done. Great, great answer. All right, I think you know what question is coming next. I don't I have no idea. What is your least favorite Star Wars line? Misa thinking, <laughs> Yusa gonna be saying something from. Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> I'm gonna be I'm gonna be very diplomatic here, and you're gonna be very annoyed by this by this answer. I I can't say what it is because it's from Rogue One, and it was another writer that wrote it. But I hate it. Oh. It's one line that I really hate. Oh no! That's, that's the only thing. That's as, that's as far. I would never criticize oh. another writer by name. I would never say I didn't like someone else's contribution. There's just one. Remember how I said earlier that it's just a couple of teeny tiny little bits in the film that I would have done differently. And yeah. for the most part, I absolutely love the film and all the changes. It was so much better than the script that I wrote. They made it so much better. A couple of teeny tiny little <laughs> niggly things. And there's one particular line of dialogue I, I, I don't like, and it and maybe I don't like it less because it's in the movie that I worked on. But yeah, let me see. Aside from aside from Rogue One, um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's funny. Um, I'm trying to think of another another example. Again, I, I oh, you know what I think it might be. There's, and it's hard to pick just one line. But I really, as much as I love Return of the Jedi, I really struggle with the scene where Luke tells Leia that he's got to go and face Vader. Because if you want to talk about clunky dialogue and it's so melodramatic, it's, Luke, run away, far away, <laughs> leave this place. Like it almost feels like we've gone into like like a, a, a whole other level of like fairy tale. And mm. it's just, I don't know, for the most part, again, that like, Return of the Jedi again has some of my favorite, many of my favorite yeah. lines in it. Um, and I think for them, it's a brilliantly written script, but like, just as like every, like, and here's the thing, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to single out Rogue One to be shitty or anything. Like I could point out a line in probably every Star Wars movie that irritates me. And there is sure. one in Rogue One, just like there is one in every other film. Um, and, but for the one that, the one that, again, if I thought about it more and came back to you tomorrow, I might have a different answer, but off the top of my head, and maybe that's the most accurate answer. Cause what, you know, why did your brain cough that one up and no, and no other it's, it's mm -hmm. that whole scene it's re it's really cheesy there and, is you know, there's a melodrama in, in that Star Wars. scene yeah I like i said really very very about, melodramatic but... yeah. Yeah. yeah and then of course this and then of course the you know it's the whole sister revelation and like you know the, the whole movie now like mark hamill has to hear about oh you kissed your sister for the rest of his <laughs> life like because they didn't because they didn't plan it out right they didn't know from one movie to the next what was what was happening and so but when you step back and look at it, it's like oh that was his sister and then the scene in empire becomes kind of weird you know when she smooches him and it's like you know i don't know there's 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 a little bit of oh the other and then the other one is i don't put i think it's okay but when when luke realizes and he's sitting on the log with obi-wan and says leia Leia is my sister. I just remember when I was 11 years old, like someone, someone at the back of the audience laughed really, really hard. And that like tainted my, <laughs> oh. my reading of that line forever. It was, it was, it was like, the, oh, come on, <laughs> kind of lines, kind of laughs. So it's like, I didn't think it was that bad. But I was like, oh, that guy really hated it. And so it has like, colored my view of it ever since. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> all right. How about this one? What moment? in star wars and all of star wars always makes you smile every time you see it doesn't matter how many times you see it it always puts a smile on your face aside from my name in the credits yes aside from your name in the blue letters, <laughs> that, blue that, letters. That, that's obviously the, that's the easy answer <laughs> always makes me smile oh i know what it is it's also from return of the jedi and it it it, it 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 did it did it does and it did more than make me smile it's the whole reason i think or a large part of it why i have the career that i have because you know every filmmaker in my generation says oh you know star wars the movie that made me want to be a filmmaker and to a large mm -hmm. extent that's 
some other movies as well, but Star Wars chief among them. Um, but I know the exact moment that um, it happened for me. It's in the during the Battle of Endor, which again I think is still the best space battle ever felt ever on film. The sense of scale and speed that everything's moving at is incredible. And again, a lot of a lot of what we do with the Battle of Scarif is trying to replicate that feeling. Um, you know, when they're skimming the surface of the Death Star after the shield is down, and um, and Lando says, "Here goes nothing," and barrel rolls inside the superstructure <laughs> of the Death Star, and in one contiguous shot, suddenly you're flying inside the Death Star. As an 11 year old kid, I my, my, my brain melted. I just thought that's the that's the coolest shit I've ever seen in my life. They are flying. <laughs> inside the death star now like how do, like we're going to attack the death star again but how do we, we've seen it already like what's the next step up from a trench run well this is the answer and it's absolutely incredible and just these great little moments like when um again you, you, i'm not telling you that you've already seen this is a nice little moment when land when again the tie fighters are pursuing them through the superstructure and lando says split up and head back to the surface and see if you can get some of those tie fighters to follow you yeah and you see it happen some of the x-wings peel off and the tie, some of the TIE fighters peel off to follow them. And I just, oh, that is so cool. <laughs> I just loved it. I remember that mo that barrel roll moment. That was the moment my little 11 year old brain kind of said, whatever it is this movie is making me feel right now, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to wow. make other people feel like that. And so that was, that was kind of the moment for me. That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, just two more here. What Star Wars moment always makes you sad? And not um, in an ironic way, in a legit. <laughs> no, actually, emo like actually yes. emotionally sad. Um, Gets you in the feels, as they say. I think the death of Yoda has got to. I, again, it's not like a. I, I don't have like a cool. Oh, you wouldn't. You didn't think I was going to say this, did you? Type answer. But it is. I think it's the the death of Yoda. He's such a wonderful character, and you know, even though he had a, you know, basically died, you know, a, a died of old age. Um, there was just something, you know, you love that character so mm -hmm. much. And it's one of the great reveals in the history of cinema. And people don't give it enough credit now how well that gag works when you first meet Yoda. Like, again, you watch it now and you go, oh, there's Yoda because he's this pop culture icon, right? But yes. try to go back, try to go back to remember what it was like when you first saw that movie. And mm. you think it's just some little swamp gremlin, right? This, <laughs> you never even entertain the idea this could be the great Jedi Knight. And it's that moment when you realize that he is, it's like <gasps> another one of those great. And so you, you, you buy into this character and he's so fun and he's so wise. And again, I really, really think that Yoda kind of elevated the, the kind of the maturity and the, the and kind of the, the, the spirituality of like you know, back in Star Wars, like the force was just something like, it was just like a magic trick that you could do, right? You could move things around and do mind tricks, but there was never a sense of like, it's a, it's a faith, it's a religion, it's a, it's a philosophy, it's a spirituality. That only started when Yoda showed up. That's started right. Started talking about, started talking in this kind of Zen master philosophical way. Obi Wan never talked like that. He was just That's an right. He was just like Ben Kenobi. But when you know, it's a, you know, I'll give you another one because it speaks directly to this, and it says so much about it. Is when Luke tries to lift the X wing out of the swamp and he can't do it, um, and Yoda then goes and does it with ease, and mm. uh, Luke says, "I can't believe it," and Yoda says, "That is why you fail." that's the philosophy of the force like just yes. encapsulated in such a brilliant way um that like so many of the great the moments that made star wars i think truly great are yoda moments and so when you know when he died i yeah i was sad yeah that's that's fantastic yeah i the uh the yoda dialogue on dagobah and empire strikes back i think is some of the the peak of star wars for me right Right. Um, and, because, and, yes. you know, and just like, you know, that unique syntax construction that he has, again, we take for granted now, but at the yeah. time that was really, that was like, oh, wow. Like he, he talks in this really cool way. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's wonderful. Yoda is one of the greatest creations of the Star Wars universe. And for him question. to be such a profoundly spiritual character who sounded a lot like Grover from Sesame Street. That was kind of the first yeah, impression funny that. a lot of people had of Yoda was, wow. Luke's spiritual advisor is Grover. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's that's kind of a hurdle to overcome. Because that's right. And of course, you know, we time. all know the reasons why, because the, you know, the Jim Henson connection is is there. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, that's something else. That they, I think they almost, like, when, again, when they're trying to pull that, 
that game on you at the beginning when you don't know this is Yoda yet and you think it's just some swamp creature that's like messing around in Luke's luggage, right? They lean into that, right? Because it's more funny to have him sound like Grover. You know, mine or I'll help you not. Like it's all very <laughs> kind of, you know, it's it's all very kind of muppety and very screechy. <laughs> But, and you'll notice that when he finally becomes Yoda, says, I cannot teach him. The boy has no patience. It's like, oh, shit, that sounds like a different guy now because he's not playing yes. a character anymore. He is who he really is. Yeah. That, and, you know, it's, and, and, by, and then, of course, after that, he sounds, you know, so wise, right? And there's just this sense of like gravitas that comes. He's like, you should pay attention to this guy because he fucking knows what he's talking about, right? Like that, it's, right. You know, there's so much, there's just, you, know, you just have like so much admiration and respect for that character. I'll give you top marks on your Yoda impersonation. Too, yeah, that's sir. pretty. That's pretty darn good. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't want to say. do it because I thought there's, I've never. There's no way it sounds good. But okay, no, it sounds real good. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to modify this just a little bit again because you you are a writer. A lot of times we're we're talking to actors. Um, so I'm going to modify this last question. If there was another Star Wars feature film to be made, and George Lucas was directing, and he said. Get me that Gary Witta guy. He knows what he's doing. Yeah, that sounds likely. What would you like to hear him say to you after he finishes reading your script? It feels like Star Wars. Hey, there you go. Man. That's a, good that's a answer great right answer. There. That's a fantastic yeah. answer. Gary Witta. That was actually, well, I kind of st actually stole it a little bit. The um, I remember my old boss at Lucasfilm who was the head of story development at the time, when I turned in the first draft of the script, she wrote this very complimentary note back. But the one line I always remember was she said, it feels like Star Wars. And that, you know, obviously is, that's always the goal. That's high praise. And it's something that's very hard to uh, describe. And, you know, it's like, you know it when you see it or when you hear it, when it, when it hits the right notes. Absolutely. Wow. Gary Witta, thank you so much for spending more time with us here on Rebel Force Radio. We really appreciate it. Uh, once again, for those listening, the best way to keep up with you and what's going on with your big project, Gundog, um, it, what website, what's the best like source for all things uh, Gary Weta these days? Yeah, so if you want to if you want to catch the live shows, um, it's at twitch.tv slash Gary Witta. So it's just my name, G-A-R-Y-W-H-I-T-T-A. -T -T if you want to catch the episodes that have already been released, and as we record this um we have three out. Episode four will be out in a couple of days. You can go to my YouTube channel. Again, that's just YouTube slash Gary Witter, G-A-R-Y-W-H-I-T-T-A. Don't forget to smash that like button and, you know, and, uh, <laughs> ring the bell and all the things right. that YouTubers are supposed to say. But you can so you can listen to the archive versions there. And again, the main home of, of, of Gundog in the Internet will be in the podcast version. Like I said, right now, currently, that does exist. You can go to Spotify um apple podcasts you know type in gun dog or you can go to gundogpodcast.com and there's a web page that has all the links you can get so you can you can follow the podcast right now all the there's just a trailer and a seven minute prologue but once you you know click that follow button or whatever don't add it to your feed the episode one will show up as soon as we are able to deliver it and again it's done you know people have heard it it's been out there on on social media on youtube and on twitch um we're just there's like to to, to migrate it to this bigger podcast network there's like some technical behind the scenes stuff that we're doing but we're hoping within the next week or two it'll be fully armed and operational well congratulations Great. on that and in everything else and if you ever have uh you know on your next project you want to come back and uh, talk more star wars with us we'd love to have you listen i i've enjoyed this thoroughly i could i could i could keep going because i love talking about star wars with with people who love it as much as i do so i really appreciate you having me on thank you anytime thanks thank gary. You, gary have a great night you too.